Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, I welcome you to our Governor's Council hearing. And I first would like to introduce my colleagues. Um, okay, if I can see them. <laughs> um, Councilor Joe Ferraro. Councilor Juvenville. Hi. Councilor, uh, Councilor Ionella. Councilor um, Duff. Councilor Hurley. Did I begin anybody? It's hard because they're on Zoom. I'm trying to, okay, I think I do. Okay, so um, I'm gonna open this hearing and um, I, I wanna welcome you, uh, Tim Tamara. And I'm going to read the letter from the governor appointing you. Okay, the letter is um, dated August 19th, 2020. Dear counselors, I am pleased to nominate Tamara Lee Richardone, Richardone for appointment to the Industrial Accident Board to a term expiring on May 29, 2025. I submit, I submit this nomination for the advice and consent of the Executive Council pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 23E, Section 4, I am enclosing the nominee's resume for your review. Now, before I call on the witnesses, there's a correction, and it has to be done now, and I will make that correction now. Um, this letter is appointing our nominee for four months in about nine, four years in about nine months, which is incorrect. I have to go back to a person who was up for reappointment and wrote a letter. And I'm gonna read that letter, okay? It's dated January 21, 2020. Dear Governor Baker, it is with deep regret that I ask you to withdraw my nomination for reappointment to the Industrial Accident Board. Governor, it has been a pleasure to serve. There is an accompanying letter from the governor given to all the counselors dated January 22, 2020. Dear counselors, Sabina Hurley has requested that her nomination to the position of administration justice of the Industrial Accident Board be withdrawn and I respectfully request that my nomination of her to that position is so withdrawn. Um, counselors, uh, we were upset because um, this person continued. She, the governor clearly said that he was not going to renominate her, and yet she has been a continuing judge, getting paid, and that's not what this council approves of. So um, having said that, I want to go back to the letter of the governor giving the incorrect term for this new nominee. Now, um, as I said, it's like four years and nine months. So the governor is referring to, he submits the nomination for the advice and consent of the executive council pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws, chapter 23E, section four. So I'm gonna read that chapter to put it in the record. Chapter 23E, section four, Mass General Law governs the selection and appointment process of administrative judges and administrative law judges of the Industrial Accident Board, whereas the governor, with advice and consent of executive council, has the statutory authority to appoint and reappoint administrative judges and administrative law judges for the terms of six years pursuant to Mass General Law Section 23E, I'm sorry, C23E, Section 4 and 5. And it goes on to say, whereas public trust and confidence in, in the DIA's Division of Dispute Resolution begins with the process of which administrative judges and administrative law judges are appointed. So I'm putting that out on the record because um, if you are 
Now, if you are approved with advice and consent of this council, Attorney Richard Dome, your term will be, if the council votes September 9th, a week from today, your term will go to September 9, 2026, not May 29, 2025. So I am going to... Uh, advise the governor uh, of this mistake because according to Mass General Law, no one has ever got less than six years, ever. And I know the council will not approve of you getting less according to the law. So having said that, uh, I will um, call on your witnesses. Um, so. Um, I don't have my list, my list of witnesses. Um, can somebody give me the list of witnesses? Oh, what? Do you have a list? I don't have a list. Um, okay, I, I wish I would really like to announce you, really, but okay. Um, can you bring it to me? Okay. Got a lot of papers, but not with that. <laughs> Okay, all right. This is my official list, okay? <laughs> and um, the first person is, um, I can't read this, um, Joseph. Okay, and, and the other one, I, I, I can't read. Judy Gray. Uh, hmm? Judy Gray. Can't read it. Can't read this official letter. Okay. Whoever, somebody. Are you Judy Gray? Yes. Yes. Judy Gray. It, attorney Gray. It's I'm Attorney sorry. Judy Gray. Did I get that right? I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This is this is my official. Okay. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. I can't hear her. Uh, can you put your microphone closer to you? Because uh, the counselors are on Zoom. It's hard to hear. Can you hear me now? Yes. Well, okay. Can you all hear? Can you all hear? Excuse me. I can't see Marilyn or the witness. <clears throat> okay. Hold on a minute. Let's, let's hold on a minute. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can get some technical advice here. Thank you, Mary, for letting us know. I can see you, Mary. I know I can see you, I can see Bob and I can see the other counselors. I can't see you, Marilyn, and I can't see or there I am. Councilor Nolan, the video on our side is good and you're saying you can't see anyone from your side? I can see the counselors that are zooming in. I can't see Marilyn and I can't see the witness. Okay. Um, I'm really not sure how to resolve it on, on your side of the on your side of the video. Um, right now, we may just have to proceed with audio only on your side. I'm sorry about that. Okay, thank you. Shall I? Okay, I, I'm sorry for the interruption. That's quite all right. And I'm sorry to the counselors who can't see me <laughs> and the witness. Okay. Um, Attorney Judy Gray. Thank you very much. Again, Attorney Gray, members of the Governor's Council, it is with utmost confidence and one of my greatest privileges to have been asked to appear before you today in support of the appointment of Tamara Richard Doan to the position of Administrative Judge to the Department of Industrial Accidents. When I learned that Attorney Richard Doan had put her application to the Governor for an Administrative Judge appointment, I offered to write a letter of recommendation. I want to recap in part why I believe that you have collectively made a most wonderful choice in considering her nomination. Reading in part my letter of recommendation. In my experience as a practitioner before the department over the last 30 years, I have come to realize the importance of certain values necessary to be worthy to such an appointment. Qualities for success as a judge include her demeanor, the integrity which she demonstrates in administering the law and the knowledge and understanding of the law she seeks to apply. Demeanor speaks to courtroom decorum. 
the method and means by which a judge considers each party's position and how she reacts to the arguments posited by the attorney for the respective clients. Integrity, by its definition, requires the candidate to possess strong moral principles and to never waver from them despite having to make difficult rulings and decisions. Knowledge of the law is self-evident, but essential to success and respect. Now, consider for a moment that one person could possess all these attributes and that as counsel to the governor collectively, you could nominate her. This person is attorney Richard Doan. In my experience, she is a brilliant practitioner, knowledgeable in all areas of workers' compensation law. She is innovative and always willing to discuss and share new and exciting ideas. Tamara stands out above all others. She is someone who exhibits grace, wisdom, and integrity in and outside of the courtroom setting. She works diligently for her client while also demonstrating a fair-mindedness directed to the injured worker. Whether in the courtroom or not, she exudes poise and confidence and would make an outstanding administrative judge. Those words remain true today as they did when I first wrote the letter, and they will remain true 20 years from now when I have no doubt that Judge Richard Doan will have proven herself to be fair, regarded, and respected judge at the Department of Industrial Accidents. It is my sincere hope that I have provided you today a glimpse into, two, into who Attorney Richard Doan is, a zealous, compassionate, just advocate, someone who I have no doubt will make a remarkable judge. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask um, any of the counselors if you have any questions. I do. Uh, Councilor Juvendal. Good morning. I can't hear you. Can't close the floor. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me now? I can. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so you've been practicing for 30 years? Well, longer than that, but <laughs> yes, 30 years before the board. Yes. You practice at the board? I do, sir. Yes. And uh, tell me about, uh, do you represent clients or insurance companies? When I first started in my career many years back, I represented the insurance companies. But now I've been with the firm Ketchis Law Group for 30 years now, so I've been representing injured workers for that time period. Is that the law firm they have an office in Milton? Yes, they do. Uh, this uh, nominee has a background in representing insurance companies. Does that give you any pause? No, it does not, because I've worked against her. And as I indicated in my statement, Tamara I find to be compassionate, understanding, and very willing to listen and consider the individual cases that she handles. I can give you an example of one if you'd like, because it really does stick in my mind, but I'm not sure how you want me to approach that at this point. Sure. So we had a case together, obviously I can't give names, but I had a client that was a young mom. She was a single mom. She had about, I think her child was nine years of age and she cared for her parents as well. She was injured at work and initially really we thought it was somewhat of a, I say benign injury, but what it turned out to be was something that we refer to as chronic regional pain or reflex sympathetic dystrophy. It's a very, very debilitating disease. And when, we when I learned that that's where the diagnosis was going, I actually contacted Attorney Richard Doan and I said to her, this is where the doctors are going with this. Now, most insurance companies, quite frankly, will balk at that diagnosis. It's one that they don't want to accept because it carries long-term treatment. But Attorney Richard Doan, in hindsight, did exactly what she should have done. She had the employee examined by a doctor, a good doctor, a doctor with knowledge of that condition. And when that doctor confirmed that that was the diagnosis, we worked together to get this woman the treatment that she required. And you don't see that often, but it was necessary to essentially keep this woman active enough to care for her son and her parents. So I don't have questions about Attorney Richard Doan in terms of what she would be as a judge. Well, the other, the other concern I have, uh, having voted for a person six years ago, and that person sat 
before the council with witnesses saying that all good things about the nominee and how the nominee was wonderful. And that nominee didn't turn out so wonderful after she had a rope put on her. Do you have any concerns that um, this nominee will change after she gets a rope? I don't. I don't, Councilman. And I would ask that if it's my place to ask, and I'm not sure that it is, but I would ask that you look at Tamara individually. She really is, I think, as I said to you in my statement, 20 years from now, she will be found and considered to be one of the best judges that you have ever appointed. I truly believe that. I would not be here if I didn't. So if she's confirmed and she becomes a judge and it doesn't work out, should I call you? You certainly can. <laughs> Thank you very I'll give you my number when we're done. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're more than welcome, sir. Any other councils have a question? No other questions? No other councils have a question? Okay. Um, first of all, thank you for coming. You're more than welcome. I'm sorry I didn't have your name in advance. It's quite all um, right. You've had a tough but, day. Um, you know, you, you gave a lot of attributes. If you could give me one, what is the greatest attribute that this nominee can bring to the Division of Industrial Access? Mm. I have to pick one? Just Same. one. Okay. I would say her knowledge of the law. I really would. Yeah. She, in my experience dealing with Tamara, she researches all issues, issues that are novel. In that particular case that I was discussing, one of the issues that came up was the use of medical marijuana, which at the time we did not have a decision from the reviewing board as to whether or not insurers could be required to pay for medical marijuana. But at the time, quite frankly, it was not appropriate for the insurers to be doing that. And ultimately, a decision came down that does not allow the workers' comp insurers to pay for medical marijuana. And again, not because she wanted to argue against it, but because she had to. She did. Well, you know, your introduction has said it all. I don't even have a question to ask you. And um, uh, I thank you for coming. You're and more than your welcome. Your testimony means a lot because um, how long have you been observing this nominee? How, 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 I mean, have you, you've seen her in person, in action? Oh, my goodness. It's got to be 20 plus years anyway. 20 plus years anyway, at least. Right. 20 plus years. I, I would say. Okay. I think that's a good endorsement. Right. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. You're more than welcome. I appreciate you. Thank you, okay. folks. Uh, now again, I don't have an official list and I'm looking at this writing that's hard to read and I apologize if I pronounce your name wrong. I can get Joseph. Is it A-G-U-E-L-L-I? -L 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 -I? Agnelli. Is that it? Agnelli. Okay, so that's okay. So tell me how you say it. Agnelli. Agnelli. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the council. My name is Joseph F. Agnelli, Jr. I'm president attorney, working with my son in Western Massachusetts, and the only I can top Judy's speech is that I have a little bit more time in, in the practice than she does. <laughs> this coming December will be 40 years I've been in practice of uh, law in Massachusetts, and I've had done all workers' compensation for those 40 years. Um, I'm delighted and extremely honored to appear before you this afternoon to provide my wholehearted support in the uh, nomination of Tamara as an administrative judge at the DIA. Um, I have had the pleasure of knowing Tamara for over 25 years, probably, as she started out in the practice sometime after I did. Uh, but I got Is that me? The joys of Zoom. Yes. Um, I first got to know her real well, though, about 20 plus years ago, when she was editing a very handy manual that MCLE put out in 1991, I believe it was. Um, 2001, excuse me, 2001, and uh, it was a treatise that's now being regarded as one of the handbooks of workers' comp practice in Massachusetts, and she was kind enough to invite me to participate and be one of the contributing authors in that book, which is still available today and is edited at least once a year. As well as that, I've been able to have many cases with her over the past 20 plus years. Uh, many, some stand out, some don't, because she's always been a very worthy advocate. I've had consistent dealings with her. 
But one case, I know Judy set an example, and I will cite one instance, a very small instance, but it was a very important thing to me in how TM approaches these things. I was called by an elderly lady living in the uh, Metro West area who was about 90 years old. Still working, worked for one of the medical facilities in the city, uh, sustained an injury. Unfortunately, then they put things through workers' compensation. So she consulted me through her son. Uh, they drove out to her house, there's a little small house out in the Wellesley area. Met with her for about an hour, heard her story. I said, well, this could be difficult, but I think I know what I'm going to do. I contacted Tamara, so I knew she represented this insurer, self insurer, large uh, medical corporation, and I explained the situation. And to her credit, she picked up the phone, did something, and made things happen to the lady. Got her bills paid, that's so all she wanted was her bills paid. And it happened within a matter of weeks. So that, even though the small little episode, this, this lady was thrilled. I mean, she praised me and said, well, you can't just praise me, you gotta praise my opponent. Because she picked up the phone and did what any good human being would do, despite the fact she represents a large medical insurer in the Commonwealth. Regardless, she's been a strong advocate for all her clients, and she represents a lot of self-insurers, a lot of large medical corporations. Always makes first-rate presentations at the board. Uh, the judges think very highly of her. I've spoken to many judges about her. I've heard nothing bad about her from any judges at the board. She deals fairly, is open to compromise, and diplomacy in whatever case she handles. Um, it was in, in this backdrop that I invited her to participate as a faculty member of the MCLE Workers' Comp Update, which I've chaired now for over 20 years. It's a large gathering of attorneys and judges that present in November, uh, and Tamara was a willing um, um, volunteer to come in and do it, and she brought to those programs a vast working knowledge of the act and procedure, and it was always well received by people in the audience. And she continues to do so to this year as well. We have another one coming up, although by Zoom, I still look forward to having her participate on the faculty. I consider Tamara the whole package. I know Count Delvaney, you asked some questions, what's her best attribute? Well, there are too many to really name and identify one as being tops, but I see fairness is probably the tops, you know, just decency. I think I'd probably put them on the same plateau. Um, she's also very active in the community. She lives in Acton. Uh, she's very active in the community. Uh, she's a dedicated mother to three kids. Two, sorry, two. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, college age kids and, uh, you know, just bought one down in Maryland, I believe, not too long ago. So I believe she's well rounded. Um, she's a solid individual with a strong work ethic, uh, diverse background in the workers' comp field. Uh, I have no qualms about uh, saying it should be a great asset to the board. Uh, people at BFOR will receive nothing but fairness, understanding, uh, even temperedness, well reasoned decisions, and most of all, compassion. So I want to give a that I support her nomination to the position of DIA and respectfully request this August Council act favorably on her nomination. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions from the councilors? Ooh, being quiet today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so how many years have you known this nominee uh, professionally? Probably pushing 25 years. 25 yeah, yeah, years. Yeah. About 20 years that I'm more active because of the MCLE programs and all that. So I've had her involved quite often with those programs. So much more uh, uh, often than in the past. Well, your testimony means a lot. Thank because you. you. You know, sometimes we have someone, and I'll ask them, um, how many times have you seen this person in court or, you know, once? That's not what I want to hear. 25 years is what I like to hear. But thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for your time, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day. Um, I, I have to um, announce that we have um, Chief Omar Hernandez here. And uh, Omar, would you like to say, uh, would you like to speak while you came? Okay, I, I great. Can say a few Welcome. Words. Good afternoon. Um, yeah. Omar Hernandez, always a pleasure to appear before the council. You have two highly respected, outstanding attorneys who have testified on her behalf. I have the utmost respect for Attorney Gray and Attorney Agnelli. I'm not going to repeat what they say. I'm just going to echo and second that motion as, as to what they say. This nominee, when I first heard that she was being um, coming up here, I was truly excited. Selfishly, for training purposes, it's going to be a very smooth transition. We have to do it by Zoom. so. In a, in a selfish reason, it's going, it's going to be absolutely fine. But in, in all seriousness, she is a, just an outstanding, um, she's going to be an outstanding judge. Uh, I, I've known her for, I don't get out time because it gives out ages, but for a long period of time, I would say almost like 20 years. Uh, I've seen her in, 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 as, as an attorney 
uh, appearing before me. And uh, in this November, we're going to be chairing a, an MCLV um, part. We're doing like a 50 tips uh, on workers' comp. So we're working together um, in, in November. And I can't think truly a, a better candidate for this position. She possesses all the qualities of a judge. And, and I've seen many judges. And I know she's going to be truly successful. Um, when you said earlier, you know, one attribute, there were many. Uh, and one, I'm going to say her intelligence and her compassion. And that's something you really need as a judge to show the compassion of, of, of the people appearing before you. And that's for, that goes for both sides. Um, so I have absolutely no doubt, uh, I have no hesitation in, in, in welcoming her, and, and I ask for everyone, everyone's support. Well, you've seen many come before you in all the years you've served, and I thank you for your service. Um, we, we couldn't ask for anyone more fair or, or um, more compassionate. So, um, in, you know, I'm thinking collectively, the three of you, it's like 70 years you've known, you know, sure, put yeah, it all together. Yeah, exactly. uh, so does we. any council <laughs> have a question for Omar? I guess not. So thank well, you so much. I can't, I can't hear. Who is it? That's, uh, it's Chris. Okay, Chris. Uh, Councilor Agnella, you're on. <laughs> Excuse me, and then after me, I believe uh, Councilor Jukeville would like to say something. I, I don't know if his mic was on. Uh, not a question, just a comment. It's great to see uh, you, uh, Judge Hernandez. Uh, you do a phenomenal job at the board. Everyone has uh, the highest praise for you. And when you come before the council, uh, I, for one, uh, listen to what you say. And uh, it's a pleasure to see you. And the two previous witnesses I have high regard for. So when you have three super people like you three speaking on behalf of the nominee, that's good enough for me. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Ionella. Councilor Juvenville, you have a question? Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Chief, I would, uh, I would reiterate what Councilor Ionella said, because I feel the same way about you. And I think you're doing a wonderful job, but uh, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you something that has troubled me. Uh, uh, we had a hearing on February 22nd with a judge who you were present. And uh, that judge, in my view, lied to this council over and over again. She withdrew her nomination. Uh, we were told on the following Wednesday morning. My question is, how come she's allowed to sit as a judge since that day? Well, I, be, I, be, I believe under Chapter 30, Section 9, um, any appointed officials um, appointed by the governor continue to serve until their successor is appointed. She continued to do cases. She did status conference mediations, lump sum. So she continued to provide value to the, um, the DIA, although in more of a limited capacity, but she did provide value during that time. I was told she wasn't assigned any mediations. Well, we're going through a transition from in-person to Zoom, or not to Zoom, to, to virtual, which for the last six months has been quite the challenge. But we were you know, anticipating a new uh, candidate coming in, and we didn't want to start one case and then have to uh, switch it midstream. Then to be consistent, something we've always done, uh, at least under my guidance as previous senior judges, when there's that transition, we kind of take them offline and have them just do other things that doesn't have the huge impact on the cases. Fair enough. Let me ask you, uh, what what is the procedure to, I'm not so much speaking of, of her, but for any judge in, in, in the future, what is the procedure to remove a judge that does something improper at the board? I, I believe under 23E, I want to say section either 7 or 8, there is a process to remove a judge. And basically, it's a reappointment process in reverse. Uh, I, I believe a complaint is filed, and then there's certain hearings, and it goes up the chain, almost like a reappointment process, but in a more, not as a favorable situation. Uh, it's, but it's, 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 I, but the, as far as I know, it's never been used. So somebody would file a complaint, and that judge would then be removed? I can't hear you. It's, it's a process. It's, it's outlined in statute. I don't have it before me, okay. but I know it's, it's, it's not an easy process, but my understanding of it, it basically is the appointment process, but instead of a 
pointing, it's to remove her. And I just find it um, troubling that a judge sat before our, our counsel and, com and she didn't commit perjury because we don't have a right to give an oath, um, a truth telling oath by the legislature. But she lied to this counsel, in my view, over and over again. So why? I don't want to put you on the spot, but why wasn't some complaint made to her? Why, why does a woman or a man sit with the designation of a judge in front of their name when they've come to this council and lied? I don't understand. I don't, understand that. I, 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 I don't know how to answer. I, I, I don't know, sir. It's not, it's not it's a not judge. judge. Uh, I'm just venting about it because I received a lot of calls from people about this as to why she was still up there. Uh, people that watched the hearing, they came to the same conclusion just about everybody in that room came to. So uh, it's not about you, but uh, I'm just venting about it. But thank you so much. Thank you. I respect you. I like you. I like you. Thank you. I appreciate thank that. Thank you, I, um, obviously, um, you know, I think I, you know, I, don't, I don't have a poker face, and I've been, and I follow up on what the council said. It, it was upsetting. Uh, and I would just like to, uh, you know, it's one thing to say she lied, and that's a strong word. But it wasn't just one person. It was two lawyers that came. I got calls. And I think the most egregious thing that I've ever heard in 21 years was the calls I got. And one of the lawyers brought up a particular case. And I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'm going to mention one for the record. There was an injured, very seriously, seriously injured worker that was before Judge Sabine Hurley. And Judge Hurley spotted this pregnant woman. And she said to the injured worker, is that your wife? And he said, yes. And she said, if you can do that, you can work. She should have been removed on the spot. And you know, um, I have never heard such egregious things. And to me, that complaint should have had her removed. What is upsetting to me is that I have this letter from her saying that she is withdrawing her nomination for reappointment to the Industrial Accident Board. And it's dated January 21, 2020. Because she knew very clearly from that hearing Every time anything was brought up, any of the cases that she was so outrageous and the complaints about her, she kept saying, I don't know, I don't remember, I don't remember. Yes, yeah, she lied. And that's very strong for us to say someone lied. But she did. And what, what I'm saying is that, yeah, I have that chapter. I, I have that Master in Law 23E Section 4. I, I, I did my homework. And you're right. But you know what? All bets are off when she wrote this letter and she said, I asked to withdraw my nomination for reappointment to the Industrial Accident Board. And then the governor sends us a letter, the council, to say that she has withdrawn and I respect the request that my nomination of her to that position be so withdrawn. So that's when she should have been removed. And, and it's upsetting to me that she was able to continue. So I think, yes, that's the law. But when someone has complaints, no. No, she had no right to. She had no right to take the money. And, and I think for, you know, us, for, for a counselor to find out after the fact, it's very upsetting to get calls, to hear. So, um, it, you know, I'm sorry that, to put it to you because um, I have voted for you three times. I mean, no one knows. I have such respect for you. We are blessed to have you because there's no one more honest, more fair. I trust you. And I'll tell you, we have the best industrial accident board by far, with one exception. And I, uh, I'm sorry. I, I think she was um, outra it's outrageous that she took the money after she gave this letter that she withdrew. So I, I'm going to put that in the record. The other thing is, and it hasn't pertained to you, but it's upsetting to me that the governor is appointing this nominee 
for four years and nine months. It's against the chapter and verse of the Mass General Law. So I'm going to do everything I can to make sure we get another letter from the governor saying that she has a six-year term. I mean, you know, um, we don't have a lot of authority. I think people think we do. We only have the right to vote, yes or no, our advice and consent. But this is really, uh, I've never seen anything like this in 21 years. And, and we don't want the good name of the Industrial Accident Board be marred by this person. Mm -hmm. And so um, she was rewarded by the governor. That was wrong. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry. No, I mean, you're probably no, sorry. No, that, no, that, no, no it's, it's fine. No, <laughs> but, and, and, but, we're moving, and we're moving forward. I'm sorry to interrupt. We're yeah. moving forward. We've yeah. got a great nominee here. Today's her day. I know that it was a very upsetting interview, uh, and I agree with you. She should, she will get a six-year term she because under executive order. Because I'm holding the governor to the chapter that he mentioned in his letter, and it says six years. And I know no one has ever got less than six years, and she shouldn't be paying for a past nominee. So right. no, that's uh, who we are. But I'll to, tell you, you coming and taking the time to testify for her. It means everything to me Thank you. because you wouldn't come and, and, and sit and say that or those things. Right. So um, I really thank you, and I thank know you. the councils all have respect for you. I don't know anyone that doesn't. <laughs> so um, thank I you. thank you and thank you. Uh, wish you good health and, and continued success on the Industrial Action Board. Thank you very much. my and best to all members. Thank you. And just to conclude, I'm the executive 456. Every judge gets six years, and that hasn't changed since course, 2001. So course. I am very confident and she will get her, sure her six happens. years. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry we had to get through all of that stuff, but um, you know, I, I welcome you, um, uh, Tamira. And I have to tell you, off the off the record, I am I, I am so proud that we're all pronouncing your husband's name right, because you know why? The only thing I know in Italian. My mother told me, tu Caesar a cha, because her name was Danucci. <laughs> okay, right? <laughs> okay, so welcome. And um, um, I welcome you to make your presentation. And uh, we have all the counselors here ready to hear it. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Good afternoon. First, I would like to thank Governor Baker and Lieutenant Governor Polito for their nomination. I'd also like to thank each of the council members for being here today to consider my application and for having taken the time that you took to speak with me. And of course, I want to thank my friends and my family um, for being here today and supporting me. I really am truly honored to be here. I was asked to tell you all a little bit about myself. Uh, I was born in San Jose, California. My mother's parents were dairy farmers in Nevada, and she was the first in her family to attend college. She was self-employed when we were growing up as a piano teacher and a tailor, and she had a specialty in designing clothing for the post-mastectomy. She's now retired and living in Nevada. On my father's side, my grandfather was a miner and a rancher, and my grandmother was a school teacher. My father served in Korea, where he repaired and rebuilt optical equipment in the maintenance division. He attended college at night while working and eventually was hired by AT&T, which brought our family to Long Valley, New Jersey. He worked there until his retirement and now works in commercial real estate. He and my stepmother live in Norcross, Georgia, where they are both very heavily involved in the design and construction of the city's parks and recreation areas. I attended the Johns Hopkins University and Boston College Law School. That's where I met my husband, Sal. We've been married 25 years this November. He works at MCLE as the Director of Philanthropy and Special Projects. We have two wonderful kids. Uh, we just brought them both to college this past week. My daughter is a senior at Providence College and she's studying elementary education and special education. And my son Frank is a freshman at University of Maryland where he's studying uh, criminology. When I graduated from law school in 1992, I was fortunate to get a job with the firm of Smith Duggan where Scott Smith introduced me to the world of workers' compensation. Through my representation of the Brigham and Women's Hospital, I developed an expertise in handling multiple chemical sensitivity cases. That ultimately led me to being hired by Electric Insurance to handle their toxic workers' compensation claims. I worked there for about two years when I had my daughter. At that point, we were living in Braintree, and the commute from Braintree to Beverly had become quite onerous. 
So I spoke with my uh, prior firm and Smith Duggan welcomed me back. I've been there ever since. Early in my practice, I handled a variety of cases, including workers' compensation claims, fire litigation, and plaintiff's personal injury cases. I also began volunteering at MCLE, where for the past 20 years, I've served as an editor for the workers' compensation um, practice manual. I've been the reviewer for the workers' compensation law source book, and I've served as a speaker and an author on several MCLE seminars. Our family moved to Acton in 2004 when my firm opened its office in Lincoln. I became active in the community by first serving as a member of the C.T. Douglas School Elementary uh, Council. And I've sev served several years as a costume designer for the high school's theater program, Presidium Circus. In 2006, Scott Smith retired and I became the head of the firm's workers' compensation department. In that capacity, I have represented Mass General Brigham and its workers' compensation claims. And although I've been a zealous advocate for my client, I also appreciate that the workers' comp statute is appropriately designed to protect the injured worker. I believe that I have developed a reputation for being fair, respectful, and creative in coming to reaching solutions. I recognize that employees appearing before the board are at a very difficult time in their lives, and they certainly did not choose to be there. This is the only case that they have ever had, for many of them, and it impacts every aspect of their lives. They deserve to be treated with respect and kindness. If confirmed, I plan to bring those same qualities, fairness, respect, and compassion to my courtroom. It is an honor to have been nominated as an administrative judge of the Department of Industrial Accidents, and it will be a privilege to serve. I humbly ask for your vote in support of my nomination, and I again thank all of you for your time. Thank you. Uh, before I call on the counselors, um, uh, why don't you introduce your husband, who is here? Oh, sure. This is my yeah. husband, Sal Richardone. Hello. Thank you for coming. Now, the other thing is, before I call on the counselors, um, I want to write a. I want to read a letter um, that um, says you're qualified. Now, the thing that's interesting for people to know, the date of this letter is January 17, 2019. Okay? So this letter was given to me as a counselor by former uh, legal counsel for the governor, Lon Povich. And it's a letter to him from um, John Pulley who is a chair of the Massachusetts Workers' Compensation Advisory Council. So as I said, this is a year ago, January. Dear Attorney Povich, the Massachusetts Workers' Compensation Advisory Council has reviewed the qualifications of T Tamara Lee Richardone to serve as an administrative judge at the Department of Industrial Accidents pursuant to our authority under Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 23E, Section, Section 9. Following an interview on January 17, 2019, the Advisory Council has determined that Tamara Lee Richardone is qualified, and they put it in bold and underlined it, for appointment as an administrative judge. Now, the interesting thing about this letter is that attorney Richard Doan was not appointed. And, um, and it's interesting that, you know, I get a letter that's, you know, a year and a half old, more than that. I don't know why, but that's what it is. And I just personally want to thank you for reappointing, for, for um, reapplying. Because sometimes when someone is bypassed like that, they don't, they don't apply again. And there's a lot of good lawyers out there that we lose because they just are very despondent about the process and they don't again. So having said that, I want to thank you. And I'm going to open it up to the counselors. Any questions? I, I, see, I, I only see Councilor Hurley and Count, I don't know what's happening with Zoom and Councilor Duff. Whoever's there, anybody have any questions? I do. Is that Joe? 
Okay, I can't see or hear you. All right, Councilor Ferreira. Yes, thank yes. you. Uh, Wherever you are. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I, uh, I don't have any questions for the nominee. We uh, spent a lot of time speaking with each other. Uh, she's going to be a great judge. I got calls from uh, Sean Flaherty, Mike Caucasian, and uh, Bill Nealon, you know, some of the superstars, along with uh, Council Ionella and the Workers' Comp uh, Courts, and they all uh, sang your praises very much. So uh, you have my vote and support now. Thank you for applying. Which counselor? Do I see Councilor Juvenville? Yes, thank you. Yes. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. I can't hear you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I didn't get back to you. I know you called me twice, and I hate not getting back to people, so I apologize to you for that. I want to ask you... Uh, You've been at the board for quite a while doing business as a lawyer. Tell me, tell me uh, what the board, tell me about the board, a little bit about your, your knowledge of the board. If you know, when you know. I could not tell you the, the history of the board beyond what I know from my own practice, which began in 1992 uh, when we started down in Washington Street. I was actually um, came in just as the new law had been introduced, so I did not have uh, the experience under the old act. My training was all um, under the new act. Uh, so we started off at Washington Street with um, you know, a very old building uh, that could only handle a couple people going up in the elevator at a time. <laughs> um, I think from there we progressed uh, over to Congress Street, and now we're over in Lafayette. Uh, it, I think my, my history there, um, I, I will echo that I think it is probably right now um, some of the finest um, judges that we've had um, in the board over the past 20-something years that I've been doing this. Why do you think the legislature uh, passed the law that formed the board? I think it was 1921. Why do you think they did that? What was the purpose of this board? I think the purpose was to protect the injured worker. Um, you know, obviously, to go through a system where someone had to file a civil complaint, and it could take years before it would get to you know a, a judge or a, a trial in which a decision would be rendered, folks would be left without any income, um, and that obviously um, puts them in an incredibly difficult position, not just for themselves but also for their family members. Um, so the statute was designed to protect that injured worker, someone who's doing their job through no fault of their own gets hurt, uh, and at that point needs to be compensated. Your, your history seems to be uh, one of representing um, companies and insurance companies, correct? I actually have had the benefit of, for the past 10 years, um, representing just um, self-insured, um, Partners Healthcare, who now is Mass General Brigham Incorporated. Uh, my representation of them has actually been quite unique, uh, which is why I really enjoy the work. I get to spend uh, a lot of time uh, at the levels of occupational health, working with human resources. Not your typical situation where you're working through an insurance company or a third-party adjuster. So for me, when I can sit in a meeting, you know, once a month or once every two months and actually sit around a table and talk about the individuals not the cases, but the individuals who are bringing their claims, that you know, we're able to know things about how many kids do they have, how, many, how long have they worked for the hospital, um, what are that background information that you know, plays into how a case is handled. I, I particularly uh, remember a case, um, it was actually, I think it was with Attorney Gray. Uh, where the hospital just kept saying to me, she's such a lovely woman and such a good worker. We really are very, very sorry that this happened to her and we would love to have her back, but understandably can't because she can no longer work. And it was a great pleasure for me to be able to stand up at the board during her settlement hearing and be able to echo those words to her. And in fact, um, afterwards, she came up and gave me a hug, as did her mom, which was not something you typically get as an insurance uh, defense attorney, but. Um, it felt good. <laughs> okay, so here's my hypothetical to you. You're sitting on a case, and that case is right on the line, right on the borderline. 
you could go either way with this decision and nobody would criticize you for it. It's that close. And judges, a lot of times, are in a position where it's close. Right? So you're on the case. It's close. You could go either way and nobody's going to criticize you. What do you do? Well, like in baseball, the tie goes to the runner. I think that we all know under the workers' comp statute that the tie needs to go to the employee. The, no, the runner is the employee. <laughs> in my view, I don't work down there. I, I did some things 40 years ago there. I didn't know what I was doing, but I was helped by insurance lawyers that would take me and tell me everything I needed to do. That's how co collegial it was back then. So, but, but it's the board, in my view, is there to give, if ever possible, compensation to the injured worker, barring fraud or deceit or something like that. So the call should, should go to that work injured worker when, whenever possible, in my view, but I'm not the judge there. But I, I like your answer. Uh, let me ask you about the marijuana issue. Did you vote for the marijuana question? <laughs> Can I plead the fifth? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, I, at the time, had two young children, um, so no, I did not vote for it being legal. So, so um, if somebody is di diagnosed with whatever pain or whatever, and the recommendation from a doctor is that they be given marijuana to treat their pain or sleep or whatever, uh, are you going to have an issue with that? It's, it's not an issue for me that someone is prescribed medical marijuana. That does not concern me in the least. Uh, I think that it certainly serves a purpose. Uh, I think the, the different question, though, is whether legally, as a judge, you can order it. And I think we actually have defined case law at this moment that would not allow a judge at the board to enter specific order awarding uh, medical marijuana. Why not? Why not? Well, because there's case law on it right now that's up on appeal. Maybe perhaps once the um, appeals court issues a decision, it may be different. But at the moment, the standing law is that a, a judge cannot order an insurer to pay for medical marijuana um, because it is considered a controlled substance. Not, not under the, not under the, under the under state, state of Massachusetts. No, it's not. Absolutely. So why why is it you the right to possess marijuana or anybody the right to possess and get medical marijuana? Because un unfortunately, the Massachusetts statute only protects um, the insurance company and um, the employers who would be paying for that um, from prosecution under state law. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, they could still be subject to prosecution mm -hmm. under federal mm -hmm. law. So wouldn't you, as a judge, be better ordering it and letting the insurance company take it up to the SJC? I, I think a judge at this point has to follow the letter of the law, and we have that case law right now until it changes. Well, I, I, I disagree with you on what a judge does with the law. My 42 years of practicing, judges come before us nominees all the time saying, I'm going to follow the law. And I say, well, what does that mean? And they don't have an answer for me because they don't follow the law. Respectfully, they interpret the law with the facts in front of them. And you as a DIA judge with one case may decide something that another judge in another courtroom would have decided something different, correct? Absolutely. So you, you, well, interpret, you, you interpret the law. So. So my suggestion is, you don't have to take it, is to be bold as a judge. Make them go up to the SJC, get rulings. That's how things change. That's how people get better things in Massachusetts, okay? Uh, I'm going to add, did you study for this uh, interview you had today? Did I study? Yeah. yeah. In what way? <laughs> well, going to be asked <laughs> I, I certainly did some, some homework, yes. <laughs> let, me ask you, let me ask you, tell me uh, what rule uh, five, five, 452CMR 
rule 1.06 is? No idea. <laughs> you get an A. You get an A. <laughs> It is the modification and discontinuance of compensation. You familiar with it? Yes. No. Uh, um, what else do I want to ask? You want to ask? Have you ever heard of a case called the Joseph Gately's case? Okay. It's a nineteen. Okay. It's a nineteen ninety-three case. Ninety-three case. And it is, I'm told, one of the kind of famous cases in the history of the Dexter accident for. So, I want to ask you about it then, if, you, if, you, if you're not aware of it. Uh, I have gotten some good reviews uh, from Christopher and I, Ayanella, who I respect his judgment very much. Billy uh, Nyland called me and spent about two hours of my evening when I was reading. He interrupted me to keep me on the phone talking about you. And I said, Billy, we're going to vote on her. We're not going to make a saint out of her. Enough. And uh, Michael S. Cajun also uh, sent me a, an email on your behalf. So you come very highly recommended, and that means a lot to me. And I, I hope, I can't make you do it, but I hope that you will take this seat and act in a very different way than the person that you're replacing up there. Uh, judges, thank you. Judges, the less they say, the, less the, they say the better. Okay? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Councilor Hurley, any questions? Councilor Duff, any questions? Excuse me. We're having trouble having, hearing. I can't hear. Yeah, I'm having, I'm having trouble. trouble. Okay. With my video can you, and my audio. Can you hear me? I can hear it now. I can hear it now. Okay. My battery's running out. I'm back into that. Uh, uh, I just thought uh, we have a couple of comments. We spoke um, prior to the hearing today, and the most important thing to me is that the workers get the benefit of the doubt and are treated fairly and respectfully. And um, I did my homework in terms of having um, my law firm, Pellegrini Sealy, um, check with the folks down where you practice. So you have um, gotten very good marks and I intend to support you. Thank you. Ask her again. She can't hear. Ask her again. Councilor Duff, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Okay, I, I asked if you had any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have uh, one minute question. Um, I have a couple of comments. One, I think you have a stellar resume. Um, having uh, lived in D.C. for a long time, Johns Hopkins is just an outstanding university. Um, and it looks like you graduated from B.C. Law probably around the same time as my sister, although she may have been a little earlier than you. Um, the thing that impresses me the most about you, though, is that you seem to have, and not to say that others don't have this, because it might it might come off that way, but you have a real sense of humanity when it comes to addressing these cases. And I thank you for that, because it seems more and more, um, not just in our courts, but just in our society in general, we're losing a, a little bit of a sense of, um, you know, we are our brother's keeper. And the analogy you made of Ty goes to the runner and it goes to the worker, it is how I've always understood this court. And it's nice to know that that is the same um, understanding that you have if you go forward to sit on it. So um, I really just wanted to say that. I, I've heard just tremendous things about you um, and it's a great nomination. So congratulations to you and, and to your family for, for you being here today. 
Thank you, Councillor Duff. Uh, Councillor Anielar, did you speak? I'm sorry, I don't think you did. Did you? You forgot me now. Oh, my. <laughs> you know, it's hard because you're in and out on Zoom and I'm, I'm not seeing everybody's face, so you got to raise your hand. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have uh, any questions. Um, I want you to know that I did also receive phone calls uh, from Stephen Brendamule, uh, from Sean Flaherty, and Bill Nealon. It was uh, funny to hear Bob Juvenville when he says Bill Nealon kept him on the phone for two hours. Bill Neal and I are members of the same country club down the Cape, and just to set up a tea time, I go, Bill, enough. I got to get out of here. He talks and talks and talks. He doesn't stop talking, but he's such a nice guy, and he really spoke highly uh, of you. Uh, I have no questions. I was very impressed with the three witnesses that came before uh, the board today. Um, I think you're smart. I think you're compassionate. And I think you're going to be a great addition to the board, and I look forward to voting for you next week. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, this is very difficult looking at Zoom. I only see three councillors. Am I missing somebody? Um, Councillor Kennedy, or I, I think Councillor Ferrara already spoke. Um, I guess that's it. If I've, um, you know, I don't think I've overlooked anyone. Thank you, councillors. Um, so. I want to thank you for the four hours you spent with me. <laughs> and, uh, it, you know, uh, it was so nice that, you, you know, we could, you know, it, it opened up and we were able to, um, you know, meet uh, face to face. And I really appreciate it. Um, I like to do that because I'm not voting for someone on a paper. I'm voting for a whole person. Right. And um, as I said, I don't have a poker face, and um, I'm just so pleased. And I thank you again for reapplying. Um, you know, we would have lost you. But for people, I want people to know, because it, I, we've had some uh, technical problems, we're in the State House. I am, I am presiding in the State House alone, and my colleagues are all on Zoom, the counselors. And uh, we are in a large room, and we are practicing safely social distancing with the um, nominee and witnesses. And um, so I want you to know that. But um, I, I do want to say that um, you know we talked about a lot of things, and um, I'm concerned. Obviously, injured workers. That's 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 the main thing. They have to put food on the table. Can you tell me some, I know it's probably difficult in, in the years that you have, have been a lawyer, but is there one that stands out that was so rewarding for you that you helped that engine worker? I, I really, I think the case that I, I had talked about before with Attorney Gray, I mean, it's, we, we were really able to be very creative in that case. That case actually did involve uh, medical marijuana. Um, the judge at the time um, was not able to issue an order. He also was trying to be creative. Um, so we were able to reach an agreement um, with the understanding of both sides that there would be an additional amount added to the settlement that would cover the cost of the, the future um, benefits that she needed for medical expenses. And I think just all of us understanding that that was something that was going to help the injured worker. And, and like she said, she had a nine-year-old son and she was being um, so very careful about how she used the product. Um, you know, she was very hesitant to use it because she had a young child. Um, so you could see even her own struggle um, in trying to do, you know, what what she was perceiving as the right thing by her child, but also trying to deal with her own pain so that as a single mother, she could continue to function and provide for her child. Um, so that was an incredibly rewarding case to work on. And what was the most disappointing? Disappointing in what respect? <laughs> <laughs> um, disappointing. Um, well, you know, I did have a case that involved fraud, and I can tell you in all the years of doing this, I've only had, I think, maybe two cases where it was outright fraud. And we did end up um, getting a decision from a judge um, awarding a penalty to the employee for the fraud. Um, and 
the disappointing part of it was that nothing came of it because within moments of having gotten the hearing decision, the employee filed for bankruptcy, so there was no recourse. Um, so that, that was disappointing. <laughs> right, right. Well, I'm not going to take the fifth, and I'm going to disagree with my, uh, my colleague. Um, I, am for, I, I am for medical marijuana, but I had two very close friends whose sons started out with uh, marijuana and they died of overdose of mm -hmm. heroin. Maybe that's not with everybody, but that's what colored my, my opinion when I went to vote and I voted no. But I am absolutely 100% for medical marijuana. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I have, a per I have a friend that has cancer and mm -hmm. it is helping him so tremendously. So, um, but uh, again, um, you know, I, 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 I hope I didn't embarrass you by bringing this up, but I had to say that you were approved in January 2019, and you didn't get the job, and you came back, and, and I can't thank you enough. I have got so many uh, people who have sung your praises, and the councils have said that to you and you witnesses. So, um, you know, you're going to be joining a great group of people. They're wonderful members, and you've got a great chief here. And um, I'm looking forward for you to do good things. Thank you. And, um, you know, um, we're going to get that six years. So don't lose any sleep over that. That is, that is unbelievable. Four years, nine months. No way. It's not going to happen. And I'm standing by the Mass General Law. So I thank you, and I thank everyone for coming. And uh, uh, thank you in Zoom, even though you can't see me. I am here. So thank you, councils. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And I'm going to adjourn. Thanks. <laughs>